In July 1553, Edward died. Lady Jane Grey was proclaimed queen, and Elizabeth and Mary were denounced as bastards. But Mary was Henry's elder daughter, and in the eyes of the people, she was rightful queen. She was supported by many of England's leading families. Sir Henry Bedingfield, a substantial Norfolk landowner, was one of the first to rally to Mary's banner. His descendant still lives at Oxborough Hall. Sir Henry uh, at Oxborough gathered together uh, 160 men, armed, as they say, cap a pied. That is to say, with a certain amount of armour, leather jerkins, swords, certainly, and I'm sure a few horses. His role was to then take this small group of people to, first of all, Kenning Hall, where other units such as his were joining up to make a, an army, and then from there to Framlingham, where the army swelled. Uh, and they marched from there to London with Queen Mary. Princess Elizabeth joined them en route, and at the, as custom dictated at the gates of the city of London, they left the army behind. And uh, Elizabeth and Mary rode into the city of London to wild rejoicing and cheers from the crowd. In the face of this overwhelming support for Mary, the opposition collapsed. Lady Jane Grey was later beheaded at the Tower. On July the 19th, 1553, Mary was proclaimed Queen. Her vision was to lead England back to the true Catholic faith. Elizabeth's Protestantism marked her out as a potential enemy. For the first two months of Mary's reign, Elizabeth contrived to avoid going to Mass. Finally, Mary issued an ultimatum. Elizabeth was to attend Mass on the 8th of September, the day of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin. Cornered at last, Elizabeth sought a personal interview with Mary at Richmond. She threw herself on her knees before the Queen, tears streaming down her face. She explained that she'd never been taught the old faith. And please, could she have priests to instruct her? Oh yes, and she would go to Mass. But on the morning, she developed a diplomatic chill and rather spoiled the solemnity of the occasion by complaining loudly of a bad stomachache. Neither Mary nor anyone else was deceived. Well, Mary and Elizabeth had quite different attitudes to their respective religions. Mary, of the old religion, would have had a slightly um, mechanistic expression of her religion. Not that she wasn't devout and spiritual and prayerful, I'm sure she was all those things, but she, her religion involved doing things, pilgrimages, saying the rosary, going places, making signs of the cross and, and, and so on. For Elizabeth, those things didn't, take, didn't feature at all in her faith. People of the new religion would have been much more Bible-based and would have interpreted the Bible in the light of their own reason and understanding, rather than relying on an authority from Rome telling them what the Bible actually meant. Mary now tried to guarantee the Catholic future of England by marrying King Philip of Spain. But Mary's passionate love for a foreign prince was deeply unpopular, and Philip's envoys were pelted with snowballs. Mary brushed aside the protests. Elizabeth now became a figurehead for Mary's opponents. Early in 1554, she received a letter from a gentleman called Sir Thomas Wyatt. He told her that he intended to rebel to prevent the Spanish marriage. Elizabeth didn't reply in writing. Instead, she told Wyatt's messenger, with careful ambiguity, that she would do as God would direct her. Within days, Wyatt had raised an army of 7,000 men in the southeast and marched on London. As Wyatt's army drew closer to the capital, there was panic in Mary's court. Mary ordered Elizabeth to come to Whitehall, where she could be kept under control. But Elizabeth claimed that she was ill. 
Mary's doctors confirmed the illness, but said, nevertheless, that she was well enough to travel. It took her 11 days to cover the 23 miles to London. By the time she arrived, Wyatt's rebellion had collapsed. He had overestimated support for his cause. Wyatt was beheaded and quartered on Tower Hill. At first, Elizabeth was detained and interrogated at Whitehall. Then it was decided to send her to the Tower. The night before the journey, Elizabeth wrote to Mary. She was writing for her life. I most humbly beseech your majesty that I be not condemned without answer and due proof, which it seems that I now am. For without cause proved, I am commanded to go to the Tower, a place more wanted for a false traitor than a true subject. This is the letter that Elizabeth writes at this most desperate moment of her life. She begins with a fine, firm, clear hand, but gradually, as the pressure of circumstances gets to her. Remember, she thought that she'd only days, perhaps even hours, before she was executed. The handwriting becomes looser and more irregular. She makes mistakes, and then she corrects them. But finally, she's run out of things to say and time to say them in, and still she's only a quarter of the way down the second page. Then, as a primitive security device, to stop anybody forging her handwriting and making incriminating additions to the letter. She draws long diagonal strokes that almost fill up the page. They leave just space at the very bottom for a postscript. I humbly crave, but only one word with yourself. It summarises the entire letter. And then, at the right, she signs off. Your Highness's most faithful subject from the beginning and shall be to my end. Elizabeth's letter was a long one, deliberately so, because by the time she had finished, the tide was too high for a boat to be able to make the journey safely to the tower. She'd bought herself a few precious hours, but to no avail. Mary didn't even deign to reply. Early the next morning, Elizabeth was rowed up the river to the tower. The rain was falling in a steady drizzle. Elizabeth knew that most of those who made this voyage would never make another. When Elizabeth landed, the river was very high and the steps were very slippery. She found it difficult to keep her feet. She found it even more difficult to control her terror. I never thought to come here a prisoner. I beseech you all, my friends and fellows, bear witness that I come here no traitor, but as true a subject to the Queen's Majesty as any now alive. At the top of the steps stood the soldiers. They were there to guard her. Instead, they fell on their knees crying, God save your grace.